Okay. So hello everyone. My name is Sherry Townsend Bobbitt and I will be the room monitor for this presentation. Uh, I do ask if you could all please mute uh, yourselves to ensure less static uh, feedback during the presentation. Also, if you have questions, just put those in the chat box or just save them into the Q&A portion of the presentation. Uh, also, if you can make sure that your full name is located at the top of the video, especially for our TCS students, um, that would be perfect. Make sure you receive your credit. Thank you. Well, first, I want to introduce our presenter for today. Uh, Mr. Ron Brewer is entering his sixth season with the Browns as Director of Player Engagement. Mr. Brewer works to establish a successful transition for NFL to professional football, all this aid in their continued personal and professional growth through their career. He implements programs that include the Rookie Professional Develop Program, Rookie Success Program, undergraduate and graduate degree completion, internships, and additional education sessions, which range from domestic violence to leadership. Additionally, Mr. Brewer oversees the Total Wellness Program, which focuses on the mental, physical, and financial health of the NFL players. Over the past five years, Mr. Brewer has assisted approximately 60 players in completing coursework towards undergraduate or master's degrees, while others participated in internships and job shadowing opportunities. Prior to the Browns, Mr. Brewer spent two seasons at his alma mater, North Carolina, as the Director of Player Development and Recruiting. He also spent time at the NCAA as the Assistant Director of Leadership and with the NCAA National Professional Development Programs for athletes, administrators, and coaches. Mr. Brewer also worked at SMU as the Academic Support Life Skills Coordinator, LSU as Academic Advisor, and with the Minnesota Vikings as Player Development Coordinator. As a native of Chesapeake, Virginia, Mr. Brewer earned his undergraduate and master's degree from UNC, where he lettered as a cornerback. With the Tar Heels, he's worked his way from a walk-on to earning a scholarship to team captain as a senior. I will now pass this session over to our presenter, Mr. Ron Brewer. And you're muted. So just hit that little microphone. Well, she said, she said <laughs> I was just following suit. <laughs> but uh, really, really excited. Um, thank you for that introduction. Um, excited to be here. Excited to have the opportunity to share with everyone um, kind of what our pursuits are in the NFL um, as it pertains to uh, mental health and the development of our players and their families. Um, so, you know, I'm really just going to dive in. Uh, my, my goal today uh, is really just to give you guys a good picture, just to take you really inside the locker room um, of what it looks like on a day to day, uh, what some of our resources and strong support that we have um, from people outside of the building um, that we really rely on to help uh, what, what people don't see off the field. Um, you know, and, and I'll show you here in a second, but a lot of people see uh, Sundays and Mondays, Thursday nights, um, and they see the guys in the helmets and the shoulder pads. Um, we get a chance to see them every day. Uh, we get a chance to see their families. We get a chance to see their, their mothers. We get a chance to see their children. Uh, we get a chance to see guys have their the, their first child. Um, and so, you know, those are the things that I kind of want to dive into today to give you a really glimpse um, inside the locker room, really, you know, to, to uh, what we do here in Cleveland. So um, if we could just move to the next slide. Um, what well, she mentioned all of this, uh, director of player engagement, uh, it changed from director of player development to director of player engagement, uh, probably about four or five years ago. Um, 2006 was when I first started with the Minnesota Vikings um, and I was the player development coordinator there. Most teams just have one player development person or player engagement person now. Uh, so we're really responsible for uh, 90 players during the offseason and around 75 players during the season. Um, during my time in Minnesota in 2006, 
uh, we had two people. So I was the second person to our director in player development. That's kind of where I learned a number of the things that I do. Um, and, uh, and I kind of shared some of the, I've seen the changes happen between 2006 and, and where we are today in 2020. Um, so I'm not going to get into all of this. She mentioned all of that. Um, if you're a Tar Heel, let's show some love in the chat. Uh, send, send a message. Uh, if you're a Duke fan, you can exit now. Um, but we can, uh, so let's just go to the next slide. <laughs> so um, roles and responsibilities for my position. I really want to take you to one of the most memorable days of my experience here in player engagement. Uh, so it's probably about six o'clock in the morning. Um, I'm headed into the facility to get a workout. Um, most people don't know, we, we rarely work at the stadium. Our day-to-day -day is at a facility here in Berea, Ohio. Um, and so I'm driving at 6 a.m. to go try to get a workout in before work. And my security director gives me a call. Um, and that call is to tell me that one of our players was in an accident um, and that he lost his girlfriend in the accident. Um, so this is, again, six o'clock in the morning. Um, I get this call. And so immediately, I obviously make a U-turn and, uh, and dash straight towards that player's house. And my mind is the clearest that it's always been, that it's ever been. Um, I'm literally thinking about all the things that we put into practice um, from a day to day in terms of who are resources, how can we help this individual? What are all the things that I need to consider that might be taking place in this player's mind? Um, it's about a 20 minute ride there and I'm thinking about all of that. Um, I know that this player just had a child with this young lady uh, two, two or three weeks ago. Um, so I know that he's there now and that he also has a child that just lost her mother. Um, so I'm headed there and I'm thinking about all of these different things. And literally, I pull up to his house, um, ring the doorbell. He's obviously not expecting anybody because uh, I didn't want to call first. There's so much that you can do more in person than you do over the phone. Um, and so I rung the doorbell and the nanny comes down. She's never met me. Um, and she says, can I help you? And so I just let her know who I am. And she goes upstairs to talk to the player and let her know that I'm here. She's carrying the baby. Um, and I just walk in and he's sitting down on the couch. Um, and, and, you know, the first thing he says to me is, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. And all I do is I just go there and I just sit with him. And I just sit next to him. And I just kind of just stay there and listen to him and hear, some, hear his heart hear what's on his mind, hear the replay of the incident from where he saw it and what took place. And really, I'm just there for support. And while I'm supporting him, I'm also starting to get information about her family. Because the one thing that I want to do immediately is I want to get her family up here to Cleveland. Because I can imagine somebody who just lost a child not being able to get to the location where their child is. Um, and so we start, again, all of the things that we work on on a day-to-day -day basis start to go and come into play. Um, I'm calling our director of uh, football operations. I'm seeing how can we get a flight for the family. I'm getting information about who's coming. Uh, I'm also gathering information about a car service. How can we get them from the airport to this player's house? Like how soon can we get all of this stuff happening so that this parent who just lost her child, doesn't have to think about any of those things and we can support them um, from that area as much as we can. Um, and to just continue, uh, we were able to do all of those things, um, locate, again, you know, very it's hard to talk about, locate the body um, so that when the mother gets there, she can immediately go there without have to, having to try to find where all of that is. Um, I contact our coach, I contact our general manager. I contact um, Dr. Tiffany Rush Wilson, who is also um, on this conference, um, who is our team clinician um, from specifically a mental health support and a counseling support, uh, which is what you know, we're here to talk about today. And just get everybody in the loop on where we are and where this player is uh, as it pertains to this incident. And so to make a long story short, uh, we were able to get the coach over to the house. 
um, get other support personnel over to the house, get the family to the house, and really make sure this individual was supported, not just the day of, but this continued throughout the whole week. I probably spent more time at a player's house during that time than I ever have in my career. Um, and that was just something that um, really from a collection of what my roles, our responsibilities, what things we have access to and resources that we provide for our players, that really, um, in a tragic sense, was where all of those support systems and things like that came together. Um, the NFL office reached out, and I'll talk about their structure as well, but they reached out and provided support from their end on the way that they could. And so we were able to just kind of be there for this player and that the family member. That proceeded, Dr. Russ Wilson took the lead um, in terms of supporting the family who was in Charlotte and providing mental health and counseling support for uh, the family members because she was from a large family. Uh, I can't remember, she had a number of sisters, four or five sisters, um, three or four sisters and three, and three two, two or three brothers. Um, but she you know, had a large family and it was, and it was tough for them because she was the baby. Um, and so in terms of, I, I wanted to kind of give you a, a, a big picture of what the roles and responsibilities are from a player engagement director. Um, really, you see there in the first bullet, it's really the total wellness. Everything pertaining to our athletes and our support staff, um, as far as their wellness, their health, their education, um, that's my responsibility. Um, there are mandated programs, eight during the season for rookies, 30 during the, se during the off season for rookies, which we're actually looking at doing virtually um, this off season because of the situation. Um, but I run to implement those programs when you talk about domestic violence, uh, financial education, uh, decision making, um, just relationships, and also, again, here we're talking about mental health, uh, which our team clinician will lead those sessions. Um, there are a ton of resources from realtors to car people to, you know, some of the fun things to, you know, games around the city. Um, but also critical response to legal matters, like I just mentioned to you, uh, to, to support our players that way. Um, I deal with the benefits. Uh, I also deal with professional development and career development to help our guys transition uh, because the average is three and a half years um, in terms of players being in the NFL. Our roster, I've been, this is year six, and our roster has almost flipped completely over from when I was here uh, started in 2015. Um, and so uh, it's a short, short window for our guys. And so we try to help develop those tools that they don't get um, from playing football so that they can make a smooth transition uh, out of the NFL. Um, and then that last bullet, I report directly to the general manager, head coach. And then there's some things with high performance that we do as well, um, which We'll talk again, confidentiality kind of comes into play when you're trying to you know, work the fine line between trust and support from the players and reporting information to uh, the higher ups. So uh, we'll go to the next slide. All right, so this is our locker room. Um, and, and, and this is, like I said before, I wanna take you completely into the locker room. Um, these are all of your clients. Um, these are the guys that I work with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and as you see, all from different backgrounds, um, different experiences, um, different beliefs. Um, and they're, you know, the first guy up there speaks two different languages and it's from Canada. Um, you'll see some other guys on here who I actually haven't even met yet because we just signed them um, at, um, during the free agency period. Uh, but I've talked to on the phone and, and worked with on some of their financial things. So. There's a, there's a big wide range of personalities and backgrounds and experiences and relationship statuses and all of those things that come into play when you're seeing your clients on a day to day. And we can keep going. And so each of these individuals, this is what we call our player ecosystem. Um, and this is how we view uh, each individual player, uh, because you can't just look at the player. There's a lot, there's a lot more that comes with them. Um, and to take, you know, from the media perspective, what you see there, I really want to take your minds completely out of that. I want to put your minds into the individual that I see. 
Um, so it, each player, there's a lot more that comes with them. Um, it's their significant other. You'll see there, it's our medical staff. It's their family and friends um, who don't leave them because they're in the NFL. Um, it's them coming to a new city. Um, it's the NFL PA that they, is, is their union that they have to play dues to every year who also are pulling on them. It's their agent who handles their contract. It's their financial advisor um, who obviously handles their finances, uh, which also we do different background checks and things like that to help prevent any type of uh, theft or things like that coming from a financial advisor or their team. It's their teammates. Obviously, it's their coaches. They're there to play football. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's me, the director of player engagement. It's any type of spiritual support uh, because we do have a team chaplain. And then also one that I'm really going to hit on today um, is our team clinician. Um, the team clinician aspect of it was put in uh, long before I started. Um, so I started in 2006 and we had a team clinician in Minnesota. Um, it has blown up. I mean, it has blown up tremendously from the standpoint of this individual's role um, and what access they have to the players um, and what they provide. In 2006, that individual came in, they did a session about psychology or sports psychology. Um, they might have done a section about uh, drugs, um, substances of abuse. Um, and then I didn't see that individual um, until the next presentation, which may have been three or four months later. Um, that role has changed drastically. Um, that person is in the building. That person is somebody that I talk to at least once or twice a week. That person is now seeing players more consistently um, than they did in 2006. And that person also still had, that has more of a presence and visibility um, today in 2020 in the, in the NFL. And so as you see those players, I want you to think about them in this ecosystem, whether some of you are interested in um, working in this field one day or whether some of you have had questions about it. Like, from, I want you to see this player and this ecosystem of support individuals, family members that come with them. Uh, so we'll keep going. So um, I, someone asked, could I talk to, to you guys a little bit about um, some of the characteristics of working with these players? Um, again, should you be interested in this? Um, the first one I put up there because, you know, my daily job is, and my first goal when I took the job was really to earn the trust of players. Um, they're extremely private and protective. And so as you in the counseling world understand the importance of confidence and, and confidentiality, that is huge when it comes to these individuals that we're talking about. Um, they are very private and very protective over their lives, over what they share, um, over what they give. Um, I mean, if you think about it, uh, as you look at, you know, the bullet point number three, that they're public figures. So if you have so much um, publicity on you, um, it would just make sense that when it comes to your individual life, there's some, pro there's, there's some privacy that you like to have. Um, there's the trust aspect. You know, If I walk into Ron's office and I share with him an issue that I'm having with my girlfriend, is that information gonna run up to the general manager? Is that information gonna go to the athletic trainer? Is that information going to go somewhere I don't want it to go? Or can I just have this conversation with Ron? He gives me some feedback and shares with me what he thinks I should do and some thoughts and let things stick with us and not go any further. Or can I share some information with him that could potentially get me fired or cut from the team and not have to worry about him going upstairs and just spreading that information um, and I lose my job? So they're extremely private and protective. Um, there is a thin line, anything dealing with uh, the law, anything dealing with a health matter, uh, like we're talking about uh, here. Um, that information, I let the individual know there are some other people that we may need to share this information with. Uh, but for the most part, when those athletes walk into my office to sit down and have a conversation, 
um, to express things. I have, I've had athletes cry, you know, the same guy that you see uh, hitting somebody, you know, <laughs> extremely hard on Sunday is the same individual I've seen sitting in my office, you know, in tears. Um, that information comes in my office and it stays in my office. Uh, these individuals are really results oriented. Uh, they like to be, they like to achieve results instantly, um, which from my own, you know, counseling experiences and things like that, that is, that's not always the case. Um, so sometimes you do have to slow them down. Uh, sometimes you do have to talk about the long run, um, but they're extremely passionate. Um, that's what they've been doing all their life. Um, you know, go, go, go. Um, how, how, how aggressively, how quickly can I make this happen so that I can do it faster than the next person um, and get that spot. Um, so very results oriented. We talked about public figures, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, ESPN, Fox, um, you know, their face is, is extremely in the picture. Um, wealthy. Uh, we all know about the salaries uh, about in, that NFL players receive. Um, however, there are various degrees of wealth. Um, you know, the top 10% of my roster, yes, those are the individuals who make the tens of millions of dollars um, every year. Um, the bottom part of it, um, yes, the rookie minimum salary, as you see there, is going to be 610000 this year. Um, that is another element of stress, and we talk about different coping skills with that. Uh, but that individual may only, may, may only be on the team again for two or three years. Um, so very wealthy, but out of all 90 guys, all 90 guys on my roster aren't wealthy. Um, again, all 90 guys don't have a secure salary um, uh, year to year. Uh, some guys are just playing year to year and could be uh, on another team or out of the league, you know, after this year. And then they're extremely young. Um, guys on our roster, primarily 22 to 26. Um, and then uh, what I like to highlight there is that they've transferred from the child or childhood friend. And so now they're the source or resource. Uh, now mom is coming to them to ask them about a house um, versus them going to mom and asking her for dinner. <laughs> So uh, it's, it's kind of flipped and it's switched um, very quickly in their lives. Um, and then you see I highlighted down there the best way to go about working with athletes, in my opinion, in this sense, is they do actually prefer to be treated as if none of this were the case. They want to be people. Um, they want to talk. They want to talk about the books that they've read. They want to talk about the video games that they've played. Um, they want to talk about their opinions, um, or sometimes on politics. Um, so all of this information about who they are needs to be understood, but they want to be treated, treated equal. Uh, so we'll keep going. So um, let's talk about just kind of this boom um, in terms of the support uh, in, the, in the mental health space and counseling space. Um, this word trauma uh, really became prevalent in our, I would say, within the NFL space, I would say really over the last three or four years, um, it, it became more public. Uh, the social media helped with that. Um, but again, in 2006, if somebody said something to me about trauma, I would be thinking more about individuals who fought overseas. Um, trauma became more of the understanding of, like I told you with the roster of who our clients are, uh, the individual who grew up in a trailer uh, with four, four or five kids in the house, um, had to fight and scrap for food. Um, mom was working three or four jobs. She wasn't home. Um, and this person just made it out of the ghetto. Um, so now we start to get this understanding of what experiences our players may have been through um, and how that may impact their responses to critical situations as an adult as an NFL player uh, with all these other stressors around them. So we start to really understand how trauma is not just somebody uh, going overseas and, and, and seeing killings and multiple killings, but we also understand how this individual could have grown up even in their own neighborhood around killings and multiple killings. And they're the one that quote unquote made it out. Um, they're the one that still has these images in their mind um, they're the one who, as I mentioned with the initial uh, example uh, of this presentation, they're the one who just lost their uh, girlfriend, uh, fiance, and soon and you know mother of their uh, the, of their young child. 
And so we start to really pay a lot more attention um, to this element of trauma uh, within the lives of our athletes. Um, the rise of social media, you see there, 5% in 2005 to 79% in 2019 of individuals who use social media. Um, when I was growing up, my favorite players, you know, Jerry Rice, Chris Carter, um, there was no way that I could get in touch with those guys growing up in Chesapeake, Virginia. Um, but now individuals can send a tweet or they can send an Instagram message to my guy, one of my guys, Jarvis Landry, and instantly they have a conversation with Jarvis. So instantly they have a conversation with uh, Cam Newton or somebody like that, um, which isn't always positive, right? So now everybody can say what they really feel and what they really think about how that player played, and my players actually read that, uh, which to me and to our understanding creates another element of mental stress and mental concern because, again, it's not always positive. Uh, I actually had a player that we ended up uh, cutting. Uh, we ended up, he ended up losing his job because he got into a Twitter argument um, and just really started lashing out with an individual that he didn't even know. Um, and so he lost his job. We had to let him go because of some of the profanity and things like that that he used. Um, and I was kind of on the front lines in terms of talking to him. But the rise of social media has really put a lot of different um, aspects in our players' minds um, versus what you might have seen back in 2005, 2006, when the mental health and counseling support was minimal. Um, and in addition, smartphones, right? So you see everybody's being recorded. Our guys are in this fishbowl. Um, if there's an incident that takes place, um, you know, it's, it's seen. It's rarely, rarely is anything hidden, uh, which again creates another element of, of, of stress and, you know, mental, something our guys have to take into consider on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so, I'll come back to that link to show us just some of the support that we give, but I want to go to the next slide and just kind of this highlights, um, this highlights uh, just some of the things that started to boom um, and some of the uh, examples that you started to see publicly um, where you see the one, one of the ones that I really remember um, was, you know, Javon Belcher. Um, we remember that incident where he actually took the life of his girlfriend uh, and then also took his own life, drove to the facility and took his own life in Kansas City. Um, Brandon Marshall was one of the first individuals uh, who spoke out a lot about um, being diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. Um, he spoke uh, really um, in support of mental health and trying to increase um, awareness about this. Um, and so then you start to see you know, Kevin Love and guys like that come out and say, yes, I've experienced this. I get this type of support um, from a mental health standpoint. And all of this stuff, like it really, these comments from players and that's in those things using this social media source, it really, really uh, caused the NFL and ourselves to start to really pay a lot more attention um, to mental health. And it started to remove the stigma, which in 2006, again, as I mentioned, we would have maybe even laughed at or said this individual is crazy or you're soft or you're not mentally tough. Um, we would use those terms before, but now you start to see a, a, a huge, just kind of overwhelming support for individuals who deal with these things on a day-to-day -day basis as athletes. Um, and that is not a bad thing uh, to get uh, some support. And so last year, um, last year, you start to see, you'll see, if you can go to the next slide, last year you see the NFL really started to put some things together as it pertains to, all right, let's go ahead, we need to standardize um, what type of mental health support uh, we provide across the board in the NFL. Uh, because what you had, when I first got here with the Vikings, we had a sports psychologist. All right, another team may have had nobody. Um, another team may have had an individual that comes in the building two or three times a week. Um, another team 
you know, again, you kind of get it. Uh, most teams across the 32 individual NFL teams, there were different standards of practices as far as what support was being provided. And so the NFL finally came together under the guidance of Inyaka, who is um, the vice president of player health and resources at the NFL office. Uh, she came together and, and worked with other, obviously other individuals to put together what's called this behavioral health agreement. And this was just last year. Um, this time last year, uh, we didn't have this agreement in place. We all talked about it in, in May or June of 2019 was where it was really implemented. And so this behavioral health agreement came into play and all 32 teams were brought to a location to basically say, okay, here, here is what we're gonna do in terms of mental health. Here is the information um, that we're gonna give our players. Um, here, here, here are, here's what the standards are gonna be in terms of what resources that you have to provide um, on a day-to-day -day basis for your players. Um, so this agreement was between the NFL and NFLPA. And what it did is it standardized the mental health practices across the NFL. So one of the requirements that was new was that we had to have a team clinician or mental health counselor in the building eight to 12 hours per week. Um, prior to that, like I said, that individual may have been in the building sometime to do a presentation, um, but they were kind of not as visible as they are now. But now every team has to have this individual in the building eight to 12 hours per week. And then there are standard requirements, like this individual has to have at least seven years of experience. Um, I hired uh, Dr. Rush Wilson, um, I think that was it a year ago, two years ago, you can throw it in the chat. Um, but I hired Dr. Rush Wilson, but prior to her, you know, I was kind of in my own in terms of how I was finding these clinicians um, and bringing them into the fold and what their requirements were. Um, Dr. Clinic, Dr. Rush Wilson has been a, a extremely great resource for us, uh, but her experience and, and her background and all of those different things really met what these requirements are here from the behavioral health agreement. Um, what it did also is it caused us to talk um, between myself, the athletic trainer, uh, the team doctor, the team clinician, now we all have to have weekly meetings to discuss our players and, and really, again, try to prevent what's, what's happened, what happened with the Javon Belcher case, right? So now you don't have an athletic trainer who had a player come into his office and now he has information about, you know, something he may be dealing with, but that information never gets to myself and it never gets to the team clinician. Now if the athletic trainer gets word that somebody's going through a divorce, um, and I'm telling you this because it's a real story. Um, now he's going through a divorce and can't make it through his workout. Now that individual comes to my office, we all talk and collaborate. We get Dr. Uh, Rush Wilson involved. Um, and you know, now we're all communicating and nothing drops. Um, it also ensures confidentiality. Uh, if you break confidentiality, you lose your job. Um, basically, that's what this behavioral health agreement says. Um, and then it also, we now have to provide mandatory mental health education um, for our team and then also our rookies. Uh, one of the topics that we are going to still try to do, depending on how all of this unfolds, um, is we're going to have a meeting with our rookies to talk about unpacking your past. Um, again, that goes back to the trauma that we talked about before you know, how can we start to eliminate some of our impulsive responses by really diving into your past and who you are. On this slide, you see April 1st, 2020. Um, this is one example um, of what went out to every player in the NFL as it pertains to um, our response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, this, this is the type of resources uh, that you'll see um, from uh, the, the NFL office and the NFL PA office, um, just with tips, just with reminders, just with how serious this is. This is, this is situations that you can do, uh, what you can do to help maintain your health, um, because not just not being able to go outside in itself 
is something that we need to be mindful of, especially for athletes who are typically on the go um, and, and, and people in general. Uh, but these are the, this is the type of work and information that goes out to our players now, and it's more organized in response to this behavioral health agreement. Um, and I see some of your questions popping up. It's kind of hard to switch and go back and forth, but so I'm gonna get to those um, at the end, just so, so keep them coming um, because that helps. And I see Dr. Rush Wilson in there as well, helping out. So um, don't hesitate to uh, throw any questions that you have out there and we'll get to it. Um, if I can share my screen for a second, see if I can do this without losing all of you guys. So um, I want to uh, show you just some of the resources that go out now to um, our players to help support um, them during this pandemic specifically. Uh, let's see if I can do this right. All right, so um, let's see. Do you guys see this players community COVID-19 mental health and wellness resources? Nope. I'm the just seeing your from Brown PowerPoint Brown. presentation, Mr. Brewer. Say that again? We're just seeing your um, PowerPoint presentation at the moment. Okay, how about now? Yes. Ah, see. All right, so this is, um, this is what goes out to all of our players. And included in this is alumni as well, former players. Uh, so you see the different type of resources that are provided here um, to our players as it pertains to um, the COVID-19 response. Uh, so um, we're kind of, you know, trying to find best ways to get information out to our guys. I'll send stuff like, out, like this out to our players directly through text periodically just to make sure they're getting the information. Um, in addition, you know, a uh, video just went out um, and for the sake of time um, and questions, I won't show this video, but it really dives into, hey, you know, this is what we believe in terms of mental health. And this is the measure of our support, both from the NFL and NFLPA. Um, and then you see a number of links and resources um, that we provide to our players and their family members. Um, you know, to kind of really help them through this time um, because it is impacting our, our environment as well. Um, I've received two phone calls um, and one just 30 minutes prior to this presentation um, about an impact that COVID-19 has had on one of our players um, and, their, and their family. Um, and so this is really hitting us um, and, you know, we're trying to make sure that we provide as much information and direction as we can give um, to support them. All right, I'm gonna go back to the presentation here. How'd that, how'd that work? All right. So, um, let's see, presentation. Are we back live? Oh, I can't hear you. Sherry, you're on mute. I can go back to, to the presentation if you prefer. I do it from here, Mr. Brewer. Yep, that work. Okay. Uh, so the behavioral health agreement, and I'll talk while she's pulling that back up. That behavioral health agreement has really been a big thing um, for us in the NFL. Um, it, it, it created an enormous amount of awareness uh, pertaining to mental health and the type of support that we're gonna give. And, and it caused all of our coaches to buy in as well, and our general managers, um, who are also, you know, they're so consumed with winning games and, and you know, putting together schemes and um, doing things like that. But now they kind of understand um, the importance of this space. Um, and so it's not hard for me to get um, our team clinician up in front of the team now and say, hey, this is who she is. This is what she's here for. Um, so the biggest resource, again, that I say, and, and, and for you, you know, that are here listening to this is our team clinician. Um, our team clinician is available 24-7. Um, she's there for 
It's an incident with the player. There's, she's there for an incident with the player's family members. Um, I've had to call her um, at, uh, it wasn't really that early, so Doc was probably out running, um, but it was a seven or eight o'clock in the morning call because one of our players had a family member or friend that was staying with him um, and they were just, you know, quote unquote, losing their minds is what he says. So that's really the call that I get. Um, and so, you know, we immediately got Doc on the phone with that individual and by phone or by video, um, got that individual the care that they needed right away. Um, and so this person has to be licensed in their state of practice. And as you see their experience with diverse and multicultural population groups. Now, Doc had never worked in the NFL before, um, had never worked with uh, college athletes before. And so um, I, I don't, again, for you out there that are interested in this, that's not necessarily a requirement. Um, more importantly is that last bullet there in terms of the diverse and multicultural population groups. Um, it's just an understanding. Um, I've never played in the NFL before. It's more important to have somebody who values the position, who dives and have, may have done their research as it pertains to this world and this environment. Um, it's, it's, you know, again, I, take, I, I make the example of going to the grocery store, right? All of us go to a grocery store. We may have lived in a certain place. We go to the nearby grocery store and we know that grocery store, right? But now we may move and so we're in a different location and we go to a new grocery store and we gotta relearn that grocery store all over again, right? So from the NFL standpoint, it's the same sense. Like how can you dive into this environment, whether it's something small as watching NFL Network to reading and, and researching um, how can you dive into that environment if that's something that you really are really interested in doing? Um, Doc has really just understood, took time to learn. She's out at practice. She watches. Um, she sees workouts. Um, she sits in the cafeteria. Um, she sits in my office, which my office is right outside the locker room. So she sees the flow. She hears the yelling. She hears the music. She sees the schedule. Um, and, and so, you know, she's really ingrained into the environment, which has helped her understanding of what they deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and again, so really, really a great resource and the primary resource as it pertains to mental health is our team clinician. Um, and then we have their insurance. So players get insurance. Um, part of their insurance plan is the eight free counseling sessions that they receive per mental health issue. Um, so if a player is dealing with something with themselves individually, they get eight free counseling sessions. If a player is dealing with something with them and their fiance, they get a, another set of eight free counseling sessions. Um, so that's something that is provided through Cigna. Um, actually, and to be you know, clear about it, Doc can talk more about this, but you know, as a professional, you can work with Cigna to kind of get your, um, you know, whether that, whether you've worked with Cigna before, or you can start to work with Cigna as it pertains to now that you're working in the NFL, so that they can get these counseling sessions. Um, the family as well, yes, the family as well, will get those eight free counseling sessions um, to provide support to that player. Um, NFL Lifeline is a 24 hour um, lifeline that players can call completely confidential uh, where counseling members and services are available to them should they be dealing with something. And, and sometimes players do not want to go through their team to talk. And so the lifeline was created. Um, the NFL Total Wellness Program, um, as you see, was again, something being led by Nyaka um, you know, we start to tie in all of it, okay? The nutrition, the finances, uh, the spiritual support. Now there is an actual program called Total Wellness that really supports the player as a whole uh, to kind of, you know, put them in a good space mentally and to provide the best counseling support that they, that they could possibly need. Um, and then as I mentioned before, the team education, the rookie programming, the resources, that, the education that we provide there to again, try to get rid of some of the around mental health 
um, so that guys are thinking of it in more of a real actual light of what it really is um, versus, you know, I'm going to, you know, go down and lay on the couch and talk with somebody about my problems. Um, we want to eliminate that, right? Not that that can't be the case, uh, but we want to really hone in on showing them how you as counselors help them develop skills, um, just as, you know, the coach will help somebody become a better defensive back, uh, you as a counselor will help them to become more aligned and maybe they have an issue with overthinking and overanalyzing or anxiety. You're going to give them tools now to uh, understand how to overcome that, which makes them a better individual, better husband, better father. And it's not just we're going in here to lay on the couch and talk about my problems. Um, so we're trying to give that information and, and eliminate the stigma around mental health, uh, which has, you know, again, that stigma has started to leave, but there's still more work to do in that space. And that's what we do with some of the education. Um, we can go to the next slide. I want to make sure I got time for questions. Um, so what's next? Um, really, like I said, this behavioral health agreement is new. Um, and so it'll be a year old in May or June. Um, and we really need to evaluate what the effectiveness of it has been. Um, it's the COVID-19 response and impact. Um, as all of you, as we're all hearing, um, we are really still in the middle of this. Um, and so we'll see um, you know, hopefully, obviously this ends at some point soon um, and we'll see the response and what areas it impacted um, and what we can do to provide more support and, and to more support to our players and obviously kind of recover. Um, we still need to do some more destigmatiz destigmatization, um, support versus therapy, right? So not everybody needs to be in therapy. Some people just need kind of sense of support. What dialogue can you have with Doc on a weekly basis that helps you, that helps your relationship, that improves um, your day-to-day -day interaction with your coaches? Like, you don't need to be in therapy, so how do we educate guys on a level of, hey, this is just support? Um, we need to improve mental health literacy. That goes back to the skill sets that I, told, that I mentioned before that you guys provide, right? So now, instead of our players you know, again, thinking that, you know, I'm just going to go talk to this person. I want more of our players to understand, no, 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 this individual is going to actually give you skills that you will develop to give you strength or health in your mental space. Um, and so what skills and how can we show the level of education that you, you individuals have, that Doc has, as Doc always tells me, well, I, I do actually have a doctorate when I always get surprised at how smart she is. She tells me I do have a doctorate. So now, how can we get other individuals to see uh, what skill sets you provide versus it just being, you know, therapy or we're going in a room and close the door and we're just going to talk. Um, and then we need to evaluate our current current resources and training um, to make sure we're getting that information out there uh, so that uh, the, the players again uh, we're destigmatizing and we're creating a level of comfort around getting the support you need in terms of mental health and counseling. Um, so um, that's kind of, you know, a gist of where we are um, and where we've come from. Um, that's what my job looks like and how the mental space, the mental health space has increased and in what is required for me in terms of changing my job. Um, we've got a long way to go. Uh, there's mistakes that I've made uh, that, and things that I need to pay more attention to uh, as it pertains to what a, a player may be dealing with. Um, everybody knows about the Miles Garrett situation that's public. Um, and so my response to that and how Doc Tiff and I and other individuals work to try to prevent more of those situations. Um, these are real people. Um, these are real situations um, and they require real res support and responses from us um, as professionals uh, to help them to get to where they need to go. All right, so I'm gonna be quiet uh, for a second and just kind of go and try to scroll and look at some of the uh, questions uh, that you may have um, and, and do my best to answer those. Um, and Doc Tiff, I'm gonna put you on the spot so 
if there's something that you want to jump in and answer, um, feel free to do so. All right, so I'm scrolling up here. Let me try to see what maybe some of the questions were. I have a question um, that I found here, um, Mr. Brewer. That question is, you're dealing with elite athletes. Do you feel they bring a different set of issues, circumstances with them? Oh, that's really a good question. Um, my first thought to that is no. Um, I don't think they do when you're dealing with their families, right? Um, yes, for example, we may have a player whose family feels like they're entitled to more money um, because obviously they're an NFL player and so they have the, the amount of wealth that they have and so they may have difficulties in those family dynamics. That same family dynamic could happen for an individual who makes it big in real estate. Um, so no, I think they're the same people that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I, so part of that question is yes, uh, because of the public figure that they are, uh, there could be some uh, extenuating circumstances just dealing with just being mindful of the public and the public perception and why they really don't want anybody to think they're crazy. Um, like the, them being able to walk into your office and needing a back door to get entry to get into your office versus somebody who could just walk through the front door that nobody is gonna recognize, right? So if our top linebacker wants to get support, he needs to be able to walk through your back door and not go through the front, which is, it may seem like a small thing, but it is something that we're mindful of um, in the NFL. So you'll see some of the th same things that you deal with. Um, Dr. Tiff, if you wanna jump in and mention anything, uh, but you know the answer to that question is, Primarily no, but there is a little bit of yes to it. Um, I see here, do team counselors work with family members as well or just players? Um, yeah, we mentioned that they do. Um, and they can work directly with the family members without the player being in the room. Um, and so if we feel like, you know, or if a player feels like, you know, their mom or their you know, sister or brother or whoever it may be uh, need that support, then yeah, we'll provide that as well. I have another question here for you. It says, I heard domestic violence mentioned earlier. Do you have knowledge of what forms of treatment are most effective in helping the aggressor? Um, mm, that's really a good question. Um, specifically, what forms of treatment no, because what happens is when that, when that happens within the NFL space, um, the NFL takes that over, okay? So for me, I'm not involved specifically in any of those sessions. I'm not privy to any of the information that they may talk about and discuss in those sessions. Our team clinician may not be the individual who works with that player. Um, so, you know, so say, for example, we have a player who gets involved with domestic violence. Um, they may, they will, in our experience, have somebody that they meet with that was assigned by the NFL office. Um, now, they will talk about anger management. Um, that is something that they will really address um, in that space. Um, they will talk about their childhood, um, you know, just things that they may have built up and their responses and why they may respond to certain incidents. Um, so I wish that I had more information because that's a, that's a really good question. I don't, um, but um, that if they are taking kind of from us in a sense and the NFL kind of works with them directly because of the magnitude of those, those incidents. I have another one here. It says, what's the most effective way to advocate for teams to have mental health resources from a clinician or counselor perspective? So must, what's the most effective way to have a team, to, to advocate to a team? Yes. Um, 
most effective, and I'm assuming that you're coming from the standpoint of maybe I'm a team clinician or maybe I'm, um, I have some type of uh, part within the organization. Um, examples um, are one, like you really, like people in the NFL industry are really go, 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 right? But they, right now, there is also a natural fear of missing something, right? So within the NFL now, because of the incidents that you've had and because of this behavioral health agreement, you don't want to be the one that lacks resources and an incident happens, right? You don't want to be the one who says, I will get to that. We don't need to put together a mental health plan. And then boom, you know, you have a player that deals with something or that deals with a death and you don't have the resources in place. So right now, everybody's mindful of it and open to it. So you want to get information about how mental health can continue to support your organization and your players and also the football staff. And you want to put it in bullet points, like big chunks of information for our industry does not work well at all. Um, because, you know, we get so much input. We get calls from people who, you know, from the Joe, I shouldn't say Joe Blow down the street. We get calls from the fan who wants to have an input about what we should do. So you really want to bullet point information, provide uh, videos or examples, um, and then just share the impact that it's having on society as a whole and how it could help. Uh, that's, it's, it's really, a, again, a scare, and everybody's on their toes about making sure they have this information. In place. Okay, well, thank you, Mr. Brewer. Uh, we will keep you all day answering questions. We do have to close it out and give you some time to breathe. <laughs> Get all in. So um, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Hudson um, for preparation for our next session. Well, feel free to reach out. Um, it's been a pleasure. And uh, if I can ever do anything and answer some more questions, uh, like I said, don't hesitate to reach out. All right, thank you so much, um, Ron. We really appreciate you. Um, this session was recorded. So if you are interested in viewing this session at a later date or sharing this with someone else, it will be available on our YouTube channel. Um, I don't, I can't say specifically when, but I would think within the next week or two. Thank you all for your attendance. All right, stay safe. Thank we still you. Have more and the next presentation in this room will begin in just a few minutes. Yes, make sure you see some of the later sessions. Thank you. Thank you guys.